Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. There may be some participants who um, are still joining while we start our introduction. Um, welcome to our community outreach program this evening. We are holding this health seminar to talk about the things you should know about cholesterol and its treatment. Um, specifically, this talk will focus on the following common questions. What is cholesterol's role in health and disease? What are lifestyle factors that can help control blood cholesterol? What are some benefits and possible side effects of medications used for high cholesterol? Um, our speaker this evening is Dr. Michael Farbaniak. Dr. Farbaniak is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology within the Penn State Heart and Vascular Institute. And he is also the co-director of the Advanced Lipid and Atherosclerotic Prevention Clinic. Before we get started, let's review how questions from the audience will be handled. Um, there will be a presentation portion of the event and that will be followed by a question and answer session. Um, so to ask your questions and have them answered, you may type your question into the Q&A section at any time during the presentation. And we will then, during the question and answer session, we'll relay your question to Dr. Farbaniak after the presentation portion, and um, we'll get the questions addressed that way. All right, so let's get our program started. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks everybody for, for being here and, and taking time out of this evening to uh, you know have me talk to you about cholesterol. I'm really excited to do this. It's what I do every day in clinic. So I'm excited to do it for you all. All right. So the first question I get asked a lot is, is what is cholesterol? People will say, oh, it's fat. Well, yeah, there's more to it than that. Um, it's, it's a molecule that can come from food, um, as we know, um, but it's also produced uh, by our liver. In fact, the majority of cholesterol that we have in our bloodstream at any given time is made by the liver. Um, it's broken down to about 70% of cholesterol is made by the liver and 30% is kind of what we ingest. And what's really funny is that our body is capable of making all the cholesterol it needs to function without us eating any cholesterol whatsoever. So I always found that very interesting to, to tell people. Um, it, like most oils and fats, it doesn't absorb well in blood because blood is mostly water. Um, so typically, in order for it to absorb well and flow throughout our bloodstream, it needs to be linked to proteins, and these are called lipoproteins. And when you see your doctor and you have your lipid profile checked, that's what we're measuring. We're actually measuring the lipoproteins, not the cholesterol directly. So these lipoproteins, they kind of have these not great pictures, but gives you an idea of their sizes and what they're made of. But um, this is, again, what is typically measured when your doctor orders a lipid profile. Um, there's many, many types. There's so many subtypes, it, it could blow your mind. It blows my mind. However, the two big ones that we're going to talk about that are the most important are the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and HDL, which is the good cholesterol. A good way to look at some of the differences, the low density uh, lipoproteins are just filled with a ton of this kind of very inflammatory cholesterol at its center. And it's you know usually two to three times bigger than these cute little HDL molecules here. And as you can see, the HDL1 has much less inflammatory phospholipids that kind of are in its core. But I'm not gonna get too biochemistry because that's no fun for anyone. Um, oops, sorry. Um, just a brief primer on how our body processes cholesterol. I know this is a busy slide and I apologize. I don't mean to overwhelm by any means, um, but this is just the two pathways uh, cholesterol uses to get into our body. And here is the cholesterol we eat in cholesterol and triglyceride form. It's absorbed through the intestine and it becomes these molecules called chylomicrons. This is one of the reasons why you get fasting lipids. When you get your lipid profile, your blood work done for your cholesterol, it's fasting. That way we don't have all these giant chylomicrons on, uh, on board. This really throws off those findings. Um, after that, they become these remnants, they break down, and then your liver absorbs them and then uses them to make things. Now the liver itself will make cholesterol if your cholesterol is too low, um, or sometimes it makes it, you know, if you have a problem with cholesterol production, it can make it too much of it. And then it becomes these kind of VLDL, which is basically like the precursor of the LDL molecule. This molecule then gets absorbed by tissues and can be reabsorbed by the liver through these LDL receptors, which will become important later in the talk. Now, after LDL gets used up, 
it can become HDL. And then HDL in return can actually absorb some of this cholesterol out of these molecules and prevent them from becoming LDL. So this is why LDL becomes the, the bad cholesterol because it can collect in tissues while the HDL is the good cholesterol because it helps to bind some of this extra cholesterol and keep it from forming all these LDL molecules that can cause plaques and problems. So moving on. Now, we wouldn't have cholesterol in our body if it wasn't good or if it didn't do something. So what does cholesterol normally do? Um, it's a very important part of our everyday body function. In fact, every one of the cells in your body has cholesterol in it. And that goes, you know, you know, billions of cells in our body and they all have cholesterol. That's nuts because cholesterol kind of coats all of our cells to protect it from the outside environment. Um, cholesterol is also really important in producing hormones like estrogen and testosterone, which everybody knows. Um, cortisol, which is kind of your, your stress hormone, it, it's, it spikes in the morning to wake you up. And aldosterone, which is a hormone that's very important in, in kind of increasing blood pressure. Now, vitamin D is also made uh, by, parts of, by parts of cholesterol using and in, the, in a process involving the kidneys. Um, and cholesterol is also used to make bile acids, which are secreted you know, into our gut by our uh, gallbladder. And that also helps to absorb fats and also other vitamins like vitamin A, E, and K, as well as vitamin D. So it's really important. I'm not saying that you know, all cholesterol is bad. However, the cholesterol that does all of these functions that I'm describing is cholesterol that our body can make on its own. It's unnecessary to take an extra cholesterol. So now what to do when there's too much? And this has been the big problem. This is kind of why I have a job. Um, in abundance, um, if it, you can be, cholesterol can be increased by either the diet or it can be hereditary. And the majority of my patients beat themselves up because we make all these huge changes in their diet, but they're still somewhat elevated. And part of that comes from genetics and, and hereditary cholesterol production in the liver. Um, a surplus of cholesterol then leads to basically increased LDL particles in the blood that don't have a place to go. Once you saturate all those LDL receptors, the LDL just goes throughout your bloodstream and it becomes pro-inflammatory. So basically all those white blood cells will start to gather in places with too much LDL, and this can lead to inflammation of the vessels in your body. And eventually this can lead to plaque formation. And that's the foundation for vascular diseases such as heart attacks and strokes. So another busy slide, I'll, I promise I'll get away from the, the physiology and, and biochemistry soon, but just to give everyone a background. Um, these right here, this is what we call RLP, is basically broken down pieces of excess LDL. And what the combination of having too much LDL and too much of these remnant particles causes the vessels to become inflamed, which then causes monocytes, which are types of white blood cells that usually fight infections, but also are involved in inflammation, to cause inflammation on the vessel wall. This inflammation allows the LDL to collect underneath the surface of the vessel. And then what happens is this causes more inflammation by releasing an, an, a, a protein called C-reactive protein, which some of you may have heard of. It is something we measure to kind of gauge what your risk of heart disease might be, something called highly sensitive C-reactive protein. Now that then attracts more white blood cells. So more of these white blood cells come in and what the white blood cells are trying to do now, they're trying to get rid of this excess cholesterol inside the vessel. So they sneak into the vessel and they basically eat as much cholesterol as possible. So it's kind of like a, a Thanksgiving feast for these white blood cells, but unfortunately they become these foam cells and now they are too fat to leave the vessel wall. So they collect and they build up and they build up as long as there's LDL to feed them, they'll keep on building up. And this is basically, this part's called a fatty streak. And by the point we get up here, now we've got a plaque. As you can see in the vessel, now we have a restriction in blood flow. We have about half the vessel available for blood flow. Now, what can happen is stress, smoking, high blood pressure, all these risk factors that we talk about readily can cause these plaques to crack. And these foam cells then actually start to bleed. They start to cause bleeding into the vessel, which causes a thrombus to form. And at this stage, now we're talking about heart attacks and strokes. So that's kind of the progression of atherosclerotic disease. Now, how do I know if my cholesterol is too high? You know, there used to be just a regular cutoff. You know, your cholesterol is above 130. Your LDL cholesterol is above 130. Okay, well, we should do something about it. You should watch your cholesterol. That was the old school way of doing things. Now, the absolute number that requires treatment. So this is one where, sure, we should do lifestyle modification. But if your LDL is 190 milligrams per deciliter, or more, you should be on treatment of some sort, okay? 
um, because that you, you will be at the highest risk of, of heart disease with that LDL number. And that also tells us that that doesn't happen on your own. You can't eat yourself readily to uh, LDL that high. So that's why it really requires treatment. Um, patients with diabetes and with heart, known heart disease really should have their cholesterol treated because we've seen when we start those patients on statin medications, let's say, we have seen reduction in events of heart disease and strokes. Um, what I like to do in patients that are kind of borderline, patients that don't have diabetes, don't have heart disease and have a middle of the road LDL, I use this American College of Cardiology Risk Calculator Plus, which I have the website down there. You can click on that, take pictures of it. Um, this helps kind of develop what your risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke over the next 10 years is. Um, it's usually a pretty small number, thank goodness. And other things affected besides just the cholesterol, also blood pressure, age, and gender can also play a part. So let me show you an example of a patient of mine. No names, obviously. Oops. Um, so this is a 54-year-old gentleman um, whose blood pressure was mildly elevated, 131 over 76. That's pretty good, but the 131 is a little high. His total cholesterol was pretty darn high at 215. HDL was a little bit lower than we want. We want kind of 40 or above, and it was 32. And his LDL cholesterol is high, 180, to, uh, 180 and he has diabetes. Um, he never smoked, and he doesn't have high blood pressure, even though he's not he has somewhat high blood pressure, but he's not taking anything for it right now. So 180 is not that absolute number, right? But he has diabetes. So this is a patient we really should treat. Now, when you calculate his risk, if he did not have diabetes, his risk would be 8%. So I probably still would treat his cholesterol. Um, but at 16%, anything above 10% is pretty darn high. So this is someone that definitely needs to be treated, and you get to compare it to what the optimal risk would be. What if you were like the most healthy you possibly could be? your risk at this age and gender is 3.2%. So there's a lot we can do to decrease his risk. I mean, you can decrease his risk by almost uh, by fivefold. All right, so this is my favorite. I, I, you know, medications are very helpful and I really do advocate for them, but lifestyle changes, I think, make some huge, huge differences. So I start with basically the things to avoid in diet. And this is hard because a lot of this stuff is really good. Um, not from a health perspective, but it's yummy. So saturated fats are the majority of dietary cholesterol. And this is the stuff I'm sure you've heard your doctors talk to you about before. So animal fats, so red meats and egg yolks, organ meat in particular, liver is really high in cholesterol. Just avoid it. It's not that great anyway. Um, and full fat dairy foods, where if you replace it with low fat dairy foods, it's a little bit better, but there's still some saturated fat. Um, processed foods, again, it's really hard to defend processed foods because not only are they high in saturated fats, they're also high in salt because that's how it, they stay preserved and, and processed. Um, so lunch meats and, and made for frozen meals are, are tough. Even the really healthy ones, I'm not gonna name names or brands or anything, but even the, the, the ones that are listed as a healthy meal still might have high salt, even though they might be lower in saturated fat than other frozen meals. So it's best to avoid that and probably cook fresh if you can. Um, solid fats, I'd probably try to avoid. So basically any fat that is solid at room temperature, um, so things like lard, obviously butter, and then coconut and palm oil are very surprising for a lot of people because these are, are they're, they're fun. There's health trends surrounding coconut and palm oil. However, they're really high in saturated fat, even though they're primarily a vegetable oil. Trans fatty acids, I don't have to talk about for a whole a lot much longer because they have just basically been made not illegal, um, but the federal, uh, the, the FDA has now stated that trans fatty acids, particularly partially hydrogenated oils, are no longer considered safe and really shouldn't be used in cooking anymore. Um, this is the primary place you'll find this stuff is fast foods and, and fried foods, like those big oil tanks uh, you'll see if you go to a carnival or something. And the reason why they're so bad for you is because basically you're taking your saturated fat and making it more saturated, uh, basically making it denser so it sticks to our arteries a little bit better. Um, what makes it useful in cooking is that it doesn't break down easy. So you can fry stuff in that oil over and over and over again, but not good for people for consumption any longer. Um, refined sugars. So I, find, I use the four C's, which are things I enjoy. Um, candy, cookies, cakes, and cans, including soda, alcohol, and sweetened beverages. Um, I was a big iced tea fan for a long time. Um, I tried moving to more of like a fresh brewed tea because there's no added sugar in that. So then you're kind of taking something enjoy and replacing it with something that's a little bit better for you. Um, this can, th these can increase your blood glucose, triglycerides, and LDL. And what's funny is high fructose corn syrup actually reduces, reduces our response to leptin. And leptin is a hormone that makes us feel sat uh, sated, makes us feel like we're full. 
And by inhibiting that, we can eat this stuff and be more hungry, which is, is why I, I bet you can sit there sometimes be like, yeah, I can eat that cake or I can eat all those cookies because it kind of decreases your ability to be um, full. All right, things to add to your diet. This is a lot more fun to talk about because it's a lot easier sometimes to add things to your diet than to take things away. Um, so replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats. So again, this can help reduce LDL and triglycerides and also can raise HDL. So olive oil is a, is a, a standard. Again, if you can take most of the stuff you cook with or you dip things in and change it for olive oil, you will be much better off, promise. Canola oil, sunflower oil, and soybean oil are also pretty good. But again, we're avoiding the other oils like coconut oil and palm oil because they're higher in saturated fat. Um, avocado is terrific. It's a very fatty food. It's got high fat, lots of calories, but it's good fat. So you don't go to town on avocados, but you can enjoy one or two and use it to replace cheese maybe. Um, it's creamy, has that texture like cheese and replacing that with, uh, replacing cheese with that may help decrease your LDL and triglycerides. Omega-3 fatty acids, the kind of fatty acids found in salmon, trout, tuna, and in fish oil supplements can also help raise your HDL and decrease your triglycerides. And then nuts and nut butters uh, can also do the same. Plant sterols and stanols is something that the National Lipid Association started talking about recently. They're found in almost all vegetables and vegetable oils. And about two or three grams per day can help decrease your LDL by almost 10%. Um, and that's over the course of about two to six months. Um, soluble fiber, this is something really great you can do. Um, it's really not hard and it's in yummy things, uh, whole grains, vegetables, and then a lot of different nuts. Um, by increasing soluble fiber, you can actually help decrease your LDL as well. And fiber helps you feel full faster. So not only will you have decrease your cholesterol, but you'll decrease your calorie intake as well because you can't eat as much of things that are high in fiber to kind of expand in your stomach and make you feel more full. So all the things I was talking about with the adding things to your diet kind of describes what we call the Mediterranean diet. This so far is the only diet that's been shown in major medical journals and the only one in the literature right now that can reduce LDL cholesterol and also lead to a decreased risk of cardiovascular events. We don't have proof that it makes people live longer yet, but I assume if you have decreased cardiovascular events and that's the leading cause of death, then yes, eventually that this diet will reduce mortality. Um, again, this is more, more of the same, but eating lots of vegetables, trying to switch your, your grains to whole grains, things that are just more high in fiber, soluble fiber in particular, um, and trying to switch out sweet things like desserts, like switch your, if you have like um, a cheesecake that you really enjoy, switch it out for maybe just a little bit of low fat or non-fat yogurt um, with some fruit. Get the same kind of creamy texture, the same kind of enjoyment, but a lot less saturated fat. Um, and then using healthy fats, using unsaturated fats instead of uh, saturated fats. Um, I also kind of advocate for like one or two meatless nights per week. I mean, we're so used to it. it's in our culture to have a meat main course. Um, and that includes seafood. Seafood is a meat. But having one meal that's just all vegetable and vegetable-based protein, it can still be filling, it can still be yummy. It's just a matter of, of learning new techniques to make these things happen. And then, of course, seafood, if you can replace maybe one meat meal with a meatless meal and one red meat or chicken meal with a seafood meal, you've already made headway. So again, slow changes over time tend to be more healthy. All right. So I get a lot of questions about exercise, like what is recommended, what is not recommended. Um, there's not really a whole lot of exercise that's not recommended, but the American Heart Association wants us to do about 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week. Um, so that's listed in the chart over here. So again, a brisk walk, um, heavy cleaning, mowing the lawn with a push mower, um, light bicycling, just, you know, your activity that eventually gets you to sweat, but it's not making you pant or feel like you're going to die. Um, doing that 150 minutes a week will make a huge difference in both your HDL triglycerides and can also decrease your LDL. Um, adding higher vigorous intensity. So, you know, fast bicycling, uh, hiking up hills, maybe jogging a little bit in between your walks. Doing that two or three times a week can also help reduce your LDL and just try to spend less time not in motion. If you find yourself sitting down a lot at work, maybe try standing up for a little bit, walk around, every little bit counts. I've actually recommended to a lot of my patients to, if they've got a pedometer or if they're on their phone, they can count their steps. That's a great way to keep track of, hey, was I active today? Trying to hit 10,000 steps a day, although not super easy all the time, I definitely had days where I fall behind that goal. Um, is a great way to kind of meet that benchmark and know like, hey, I'm moving. And that movement is going to really help you live longer and live healthier. Um, 
And as I stated before, exercise can significantly increase HDL levels, which then can help clean up some of that excess LDL and also decrease triglyceride levels. All right, so other lifestyle changes. Now these aren't directly related to just LDL and, and cholesterol, uh, but these are other things we can do just to reduce our cardiovascular risk. I'd be amiss to not mention them. So quit smoking. I cannot uh, advocate for this more. You can reduce your 10 year risk of having a heart attack or a stroke by 20% or more. Um, sometimes up to 50% in some people depending on how much they're smoking. The reason for this is it causes inflammation of the cell walls. So even if your LDL cholesterol is not terribly high, you allow more of those molecules to get into the vessels because smoking damages vessels and increases inflammation. Uh, limit sodium in your diet. Again, you know, you can have great cholesterol, but high blood pressure, you still will be at risk of heart disease because the damage, again, damage to cell wall, uh, to, um, to vessel walls. Um, so diets with excess sodium, higher blood pressure, higher blood pressure may have increased uh, heart disease. And just honestly, everything's got some amount of salt in it and salt's not necessarily bad, but try to add salt to foods and be wary when you're adding salt while you're cooking. Um, I know a lot of people advocate for lots of salt. They want to salt meats really well but you just have to be a little bit careful. Um, and as far as just to, as we're moving, uh, is increasing other ways to increase HDL. I saw in the, in the Q&A real quick. Um, there's a, the best ways to, to increase your HDL is to exercise. That's the number one best way. And increase the amount of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. So eat more fish. And those are the two best ways uh, to increase your HDL. And also, if you have diabetes, controlling your diabetes can also help reduce your triglycerides, which will in turn increase your HDL. Um, reducing daily stress. Now that's much easier said than done, particularly this year. Um, but taking some time to yourself, 15, 20 minutes even, just to, to relax, take a deep breath. I'm a, I'm, I'm a meditator myself and, and maybe doing you know, 10, 15 minutes of meditation, even if not every day, maybe once every other day, just can help reduce blood pressure. Also, when you're less stressed, you tend to eat better. I'm sure everyone's going to notice that too, that stress eating. You know, I want a piece of cake a lot more when I'm stressed than when I'm feeling relaxed and feeling fine. Um, good sleep habits are very important. So if, you, if you're not sleeping well, your blood pressure could be higher. And you're also at risk of developing heart failure if you're not able to sleep well. Um, if there's any risk or chance you might have sleep apnea, you must identify and treat this early because this is going to reduce your cardiovascular disease risk and also help to keep your blood pressure from increasing because of long-term sleep apnea. All right, sorry, now it's non-cholesterol stuff, but all right. So medications, this is why I know a lot of you have come to talk about medications, particularly statins. But we're also gonna talk about azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, and also a newer medication that will be on the market hopefully before the end of the year. So I'm pretty excited about it. So first let's talk about statins. This is the mainstay of cholesterol treatment and it's the most well-studied of all the medications for cholesterol. But I know that it's a bad word. This is a word of curse for many people I've talked to in clinic. Um, how statins work is that they block this pathway right here. So this is the pathway our liver uses to make cholesterol and introduce it back into the bloodstream. This little enzyme right here called HMG-CoA reductase, statins block this pathway. So then mevalonate is not made. And when that's not made, you don't produce excess cholesterol in the liver. Now, there are other pathways that can, make, uh, that can, that can uh, create cholesterol in your liver, but this is the main pathway. So this does have a significant uh, reduction in your LDL level. So it's really, really cool. Um, this is also this CoA you might recognize. Um, um, coenzyme Q10 is also made in this pathway. Now there's also 20 other ways that coenzyme Q10 can be made. Not 20, that's an exaggeration. There's a few other ways where coenzyme Q10 can be made, but this is one of the pathways, which is why some people really stand by taking coenzyme Q10 with their statins to prevent side effects. If it works, great but there's no proof in the medical literature that really does anything. So as long as it's not expensive for you and you're taking it and, it's, and you, you enjoy it, it's not bothering you, that's fine. There's nothing dangerous taking coenzyme Q10. We just haven't really seen a lot of the benefits of taking coenzyme Q10 yet. All right, so there are multiple different types and strengths of statins. Um, there's low intensity, moderate intensity, high intensity. If you have heart disease or diabetes, we kind of recommend starting in the moderate to high intensity range. But most people, I'll start them at a pretty low dose because um, you want to monitor for side effects and make sure people can tolerate a lower dose before you start to increase it. Um, as you can see, Simvastatin, which is an oldie, even at the even at, uh, highest doses available, really only gets to moderate intensity. 
And the only two high intensity ones we know of are atorvastatin, also known as Lipitor, and rosuvastatin, previously known as Crestor. Now the side effects. Um, Statins have been villainized. Like I said, it's a bad word to use in clinics sometimes, mainly because of the side effect of myalgias or muscle aches um, or muscle cramps. But despite, um, I mean, it, it, and this is despite the fact that it has been shown in multiple clinical trials to lead to less heart disease and also decreased mortality. There's not many medications I can give you where I can tell you, hey, this will make you live long. Um, it, it just doesn't happen very often in medicine. So that's why I get really excited uh, about statin medications. Um, so myalgia is also known as muscle cramps and sometimes inflammation in the muscles. This is due to mevalonate, that one uh, part of the pathway that isn't being made. Mevalonate interacts with the calcium channels in your muscles. And if the calcium channels aren't working properly, you can get muscle cramps. However, it's not everybody. In the clinical trials that we did compared to placebo, only about one to 5% of people have these complaints. Now, when I, in the clinical setting, in actual real life outside of these clinical trials, I mean, it's usually maybe one in 20 or one in 10. Uh, or five to 10% of the population that I see will have side effects on statins. However, it's, it's different for everyone. Just because someone else had a problem with a statin doesn't mean you don't have a problem with the same statin. And just because you had a problem with one type of statin doesn't mean you have a problem with a different type. Now I'm gonna get into that a little bit. Um, the scariest part, when people hear the horror stories of, of statins, it's, it's rhabdomyolysis. So basically the muscle cramps inflammation along with kidney failure. But this is exceedingly uncommon. I have seen it once. And it was in a patient who was taking another medication also helped uh, progress people to, to kidney failure. So less than 0.1% of patients in randomized control trials, and even less so in observational studies. Um, it should not be used in pregnant women. I have, I have many women in my clinic who are of childbearing age, and when, they get, when they're trying to get pregnant, we take them off statins. I don't care how high your cholesterol is, you know, if you're trying to get pregnant, you should not be on a statin because it can really affect uh, uh, babies as they're being formed, particularly in the first trimester. Now, we all heard a lot about new onset diabetes. This is a big thing in the media um, and also in our medical journals for a while. It occurred in 0.1% of patients with moderate dose statins and 0.3% high dose statins. But when they reviewed this, when they reviewed this in 2012, after it was put out in 2010, they found that it was entirely population dependent. The patients that develop diabetes are patients that were going to develop diabetes anyway. They're all the people that have the same risk factors to start with. They had elevated glucose, they had obesity, and they had high blood pressure. They were already at risk. So when they looked back at it and did a meta-analysis, they found out, gosh, statin or no statin, the same patients still develop diabetes. So this is something that's more or less become debunked, even though it's still considered a black box warning by the FDA. Now, here's some things you might have heard of. Um, I take a statin, I'm gonna have memory or cognition defects or it can cause Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Can it cause renal dysfunction, lung disease, strokes, cataracts, tendon ruptures and low testosterone because cholesterol is used in testosterone. However, this is all unfounded. Multiple meta-analyses, in fact, one that was just done a couple of weeks ago, found out over 129 studies using over 100,000 people, there was no evidence of memory or cognition defects related to statin therapy. It's related to age. And statins are having people live longer. And then as we live longer, the older we get, the more likely we are to develop dementia or cognitive decline. Um, as far as low testosterone is concerned, our liver can make enough cholesterol, even with statins on board, that we're still making enough testosterone. And they studied patients with LDL cholesterols of 25 or less, really, really low LDL cholesterol. And still, they didn't find any issues as far as testosterone production in those people. And here's a big one. And this is something I talk to people about in clinic a lot because not all statins are the same. Just because they do a similar mechanism doesn't mean they're metabolized the same way. And the way they're metabolized is a big reason why some of them cause symptoms. So the lipophilic statins, so simvastatin being the first statin was very lipophilic. Lovastatin is somewhat lipophilic and atorvastatin is fairly lipophilic. They tend to work better because by saying they're lipophilic means that they absorb well in fat, which is you know, where our cholesterol is going to gather. Um, however, they're all metabolized in the liver as well, and they all can cause issues um, with, with myalgias. Now, if someone comes to me and they have a problem with, let's say, a Torvacent or Lipitor, I'll say, gosh, that's a lipophilic statin. How about we try a hydrophilic statin? Hydrophilic statins can absorb better in water. We tend to secrete them a lot easier, and they tend to have 10 to 20 times less the rate of side effects like myalgias and muscle cramps that the lipophilic statins might. 
Um, also, I found it very effective in medications like Resuvastatin or Crestor. It's a different pathway in the liver. It's CYP2C9, like Fluvastatin is, and it's longer acting. So I've actually switched some people to five milligrams of Resuvastatin, maybe one to three times per week. It was easy to tolerate, and we still had a reduction. There was a study done back in 2008 you, doing just this with one time a week and three time a week Resuvastatin. It was tolerated by more 30% more patients than daily dosing, and there's still an LDL reduction of almost 40%. So I think that's still a big win. It's not, again, not your goal of 50% or more, but that's still a great reduction, and you can take it because you're not having the side effects by just changing the dosing structure. So there are some people that no matter what I do, uh, the statins just aren't working for them. And that's okay, because there's a lot of other options out there. Um, azetamide is the oldest option. Uh, it was made famous in 2015 with the Improve It trial when it was used with simvastatin and was shown to work better with simvastatin than simvastatin alone. Um, it, inhibits, oh, well, it inhibits a protein that basically absorbs uh, cholesterol into the bloodstream. So it blocks this channel right here where the cholesterol will come through and go into the vessel. Um, it's not a statin, it's not all related to statin, and it's not metabolized at all like statins. You will not get muscle cramps on azetamide. If you do, it's not related to the azetamide, it's something else. Um, it can be used alone. Typically, it works better over the age of 75 when used alone um, compared, and it can also be used with statins. If you're on a maximum dose statin and your, your cholesterol is still not at goal, we can add azetamide, and that, can, that more than likely will get you to the goal. Now, some of the side effects. So we re I reviewed a lot of studies uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, and the majority of the adverse effects of azetamide are very rare and very mild. Uh, the most common is GI upset and some diarrhea. Um, mostly it's indigestion. Um, and people complain about this usually for about two weeks. And I kind of tell them like, hey, I know it's a bother. You know, take some Pepto, take some Tums. It's make, giving you some acid reflux. After about two weeks, I check back in with them. And most people say, oh, no, now I'm feeling okay. It went away. Um, and that's because your body's getting used to not absorbing as much cholesterol. Um, we really shouldn't use it with a phenofibrate. That's a medication used to treat high triglycerides or fat in the bloodstream. Um, and when you use the phenofibrate, the pheno, it can cause the phenofibrate to have muscle effects. So I try not to use those two things together if I, if I can prevent it. Um, it's category C in pregnancy, which means you could use it, but I wouldn't, gosh, I just don't mess with that. I just, the zetamide goes away too. All right. Now, to the kind of more fun, more new stuff. So I'm gonna introduce you to a, a long word here. Proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type nine or PCSK9, I've been practicing. Um, this is basically a little enzyme or a little protein right here that our body makes naturally. And these are the LDL receptors that basically help us absorb the extra, the extra LDL in our bloodstream. The more LDL receptors you have, the less LDL cholesterol will be in your bloodstream and the less chance of developing heart disease. Yay, so we love LDL receptors. Um, the problem with gene a genetic form of uh, high cholesterol called familial hypercholesterolemia is that their body either makes too much of this PCSK9 or too little LDL receptors. What this PCSK9 does is it binds to the LDL receptors and causes it to be broken down. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, why would our body make something that, that doesn't help us? Well, when your cholesterol is normal, this is very helpful because it prevents your cholesterol from being too low. Now we're finding out that too low is not really too low, but it's basically a feedback loop to kind of help keep your cholesterol cycling well. But what we're finding out is that we just, we have excess LDL. It's not just our genotype, but also, you know, with our eating, eating habits and that we're not, you, we're basically saturating these LDL receptors. And once that happens, the rest of the LDL kind of swims out in the bloodstream and can lead to plaque formation. Now, how these things work, so PCSK inhibitors, they're IgG antibodies. They're actually antibodies that we produce. Um, they bind to PCSK9. They bind one-to-one -one with these proteins and prevent them from working. By doing so, we prevent the breakdown of these LDL receptors, and now there's a ton of them. So now we can collect more LDL from the bloodstream, and you can have a reduction of 50% or more. I've had some people start these medications, and they went from an LDL of 182, even on stat medications, down to an LDL of 30 or 40, well below the goal of less than 70 in patients with heart disease. Um, there's two drugs approved so far. There's evolucumab or Pafa and alirocumab or Pralulent, and they're injectable medications, which I know it's a turnoff, but you know what? There's no problems with muscle aches or pains. So some people that can't tolerate statins, 
will then move on to these drugs if they're high enough risk. And then, you know, it tends to work out better for them. But they are injectable. So I've injected them either once every two weeks or once every four weeks. So they are very safe. We've done two large clinical trials with over 50,000 people in a lot of these trials. Um, one's Odyssey and one is Fourier. When looked at, there was no significant side effects. And by significant, I mean life-altering. Um, there's always side effects, and this is some of them. The most common, about 5 to 10% of people, had injection site reactions. Um, itchiness and redness where they injected usually lasts about a day or two, which is four days a month then, or two days a month if you're on the every month dosing. Um, and usually can be avoided, and I've, I've told you this before, to just switch up the sites. Usually inject into your belly, don't inject into your thigh because that could hurt. Um, but injecting into your belly, in the soft parts of your belly, and just kind of rotating the site every two weeks will help try to avoid these injection site reactions. Now, in, in other reactions that were described were fatigue and upper respiratory tract infections. However, the people that take these drugs are not immunocompromised, their immune system works just fine, and they occurred in the exact same rate in both the drug group and the placebo group. So we haven't really explained why that's happening at all, but the fact that it happened in the drug group and the placebo group tells us that may not be related to the drug at all. So a new medication on the horizon, get excited. It's not yet FDA approved, but likely should be available by the end of the year. It should have been available now, but this is one thing that COVID helped to, to push back a bit because you know, we've got a lot bigger things to, to, to deal with than cholesterol, but let's get back to cholesterol now. Um, so it's not approved yet, it should be approved by December is my hope, keep our fingers crossed. Um, what it is, it's basically the small interfering RNA. So not too dissimilar to some of the same technology used to create the COVID vaccine. This interfering RNA, what it does, it tends, it blocks the place where the PCSK9 genes get transcribed to become the PCSK9 protein. By preventing that, PCSK9 can't be made. And in doing that, it prevents the synthesis of this protein and increases the amount of LDL receptors. That's the, the, the simplified version. It, it's, it's mega complex, but no one wants to hear about biochemistry right now. It's, it'll take too long, nobody wants that. Um, it's one injection every six months. That's insane. If someone told you you can control your cholesterol and, and perhaps increase your, your lifespan with one injection every six months, man, I, I, would, I would sign up. Um, but it must be given under physician supervision um, under, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an office. Um, there's been no significant adverse effects so far. The Orion 1, 2, and 3 trials are all completed. They ended in March of last year, um, and there was no significant adverse event, events except, of course, um, injection site reactions where people will get itchy and sometimes redness for up to two days after injection. Um, fatigue and muscle aches in arms and headache occurred equally in both the placebo group and drug group. In fact, the muscle cramps happened more in the placebo group than the drug group. So we have not found a connection between the drug and the side effect at that time. So that is, I think, all that I have. Um, just to let you guys know, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. Um, if you have questions um, about your cholesterol or about the management of your cholesterol or just to discuss your cardiovascular disease risk, um, you can contact our access center at the number provided. Um, you can ask to be referred to the Lipid Clinic. The Lipid Clinic is the one that I, I co-direct with Dr. Eric Chan and uh, Dr. Greg Caputo. Um, and you'll end up seeing one of us. And if it's just to maybe see a cardiologist for a number of different reasons, then that number is also a good way to get you in contact with our wonderful cardiologists. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you again for, for having me come talk to you and for listening so intently. Um, and I guess I'll open it up to, to questions now. Okay, we, the first question we have, um, thank you, uh, doctor, uh, for this valuable presentation. I've been taking 20 milligrams of Astro, Atorvastin for years. Mm -hmm. What dangers might I be incurring without knowing it? So that's a good question. At 20 milligrams of Atorvastatin, you're not likely to have any dangers except for the danger of, of living longer and having lower cholesterol. Um, the things that people were worried about, and people talk about this a lot, about the increased chance of diabetes and cognitive issues, those have all been seen to be unfounded. Um, so as far as unknown dangers, the only thing I would do is when you check your cholesterol profile with your primary care physician or whoever's checking your cholesterol right now, every year, every two years, check a liver function test as well, just to make sure that your liver function tests are normal. 
999 times out of 1,000 it is, but if it does increase three times higher than normal, that's a good reason to either decrease the dose or change your medication. Okay, we have a couple questions that kind of um, circle around um, red yeast rice. Uh, does red yeast rice help at all or is it more of a myth? Um, and as far as a natural supplement, supplement to decrease overall cholesterol as, as such as red yeast rice? That's a really good question. So it's funny because red yeast rice is a statin. Um, it's what statins end up being derived from is actually some, excuse me, uh, red yeast um, and other, other, other yeasts and other plants to make statins. The only problem with red yeast rice is you do not know what your dose is. Um, so sometimes let's compare it to simvastatin because that's a simvastatin comes almost entirely from, from red yeast rice. Um, if you, you, know, you take one pill of red yeast rice uh, one day, it could be five milligrams of atorvastatin. You take some the next day, it could be a hundred milligrams of, 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 sorry, of simvastatin. Um, and the problem with that is if you don't know what dosing you're, you're getting at any given time because red yeast rice is not dosed that way, um, you can still have some of the same side effects you will with statins. Um, if you're taking red yeast rice, you're, more, you're, you're probably better off uh, taking a statin anyway, since then at least we can control the dosage and prevent, prevent some of the side effects. So you can get like liver damage with too much red yeast rice. So far, there's not been a lot of supplements uh, that have been helpful in decreasing cholesterol, though we are continually looking, obviously. There's some, some information that even Earl Grey tea, uh, because the bergamot oil in Earl Grey tea can help decrease LDL. But Although we've seen a decrease LDL, it's not a significant decrease, maybe one to 2%, uh, probably you can have the same effect by eating more fish. <laughs> Another question, um, my LDL went through the roof, went on statins, Lipitor and then cholesterol. My LDL went up, but my HDL is 150. People tell me that they have never heard of this, of this high, and HDL level overall is 354. When I was on statins, I also had nightmares. Is this common? Now on Rapatha. Oh, good. Um, and they plan on getting a blood test in May to see how it's working. Gotcha. None, none of what is just described is common at all. So nightmares are very uncommon. Uh, in fact, I've never actually seen nightmares um, with statins so far. Um, but what you're describing, the HDL being above 100 is, is a very, it's a topic of research right now. There's a topic of debate because we say, oh, HDL is good cholesterol or good cholesterol, but above 100, HDL can have orthogenic effects. So HDL itself can be a particularly problematic uh, protein if in excess, like everything good, too much of a good thing can potentially be bad. Um, so I try, I, after, a, after 100, I get a little worried about heart disease risk. Um, and I think Rapatha is, a, is an awesome choice because it sounds like you might have a genetic abnormality of cholesterol production in order to get an HDL that high, as well as an LDL that does not respond to statins. Um, so I definitely seek out genetic testing. Okay. Um, why is it recommended to avoid grapefruit when taking Lipitor? I, I get mad at this. Um, so when you take grapefruit, it can basically, grapefruit interacts with the enzyme that metabolizes Lipitor and a lot of the other statins, except for rosuvastatin and pravastatin. Um, and by inhibiting it, you can decrease the effectiveness of um, the atorvastatin. In some cases, it actually increases the effectiveness. So we don't know exactly if we're getting the right dose in yet. Um, but it doesn't mean don't eat grapefruit. It means just don't drink a giant glass of grapefruit juice and eat a half a grapefruit with your meds. So let's say if you take your, your atorvastatin at nighttime, um, which is why I tend to recommend people take it, then when the morning comes, you can have a half a grapefruit, a glass of grapefruit juice. Now, I wouldn't go crazy and just drink grapefruit juice all day, but you have to really drink grapefruit in excess for it to really affect the statin metabolism. Can Rapatha cause lymphodemia? I have stage one breast cancer, age is 62. It's under control on four BP meds. Um, so Rapatha does not cause lymphopenia in the major studies that have been done so far. Let's see. My cardiac calcium score was 147. How bad is this? It's a good question. Um, it's not bad, not good. 
Um, that is, it kind of puts you in like a, a, a moderate risk category if it's above 100. Um, pretty much, if it's, if it's zero, if you have a, cor a coronary calcium score that's zero, you're, you're good. Basically, the chance of you having a heart attack or a stroke for the next 10 years is, is close to 0%. Um, but after zero, the, it kind of increased exponentially. So 100 is not the worst. So 200, I get kind of worried. 400, I get really worried. But 100, depending on age and your cholesterol, I may recommend, I rec may recommend uh, treatment. Okay. One question. How low is too low for cholesterol? I love that question. I'm sorry for not putting it in my talk. So we, we always talk about what is too low. Um, too low 20 years ago was 50. Then we found out when we got lower than 50, people did great. They did better than expected. So then we moved it. We moved it to 40. The Fourier trials and the, the Odyssey trials using these PCS9 inhibitors, now we found out that we can go really low. In this trial, we had patients that had LDLs below 10. And those patients did okay. The only thing that was increased in patients with LDL cholesterol is less than 10 was cataracts. Now, I, I don't know the mechanism of that. We've talked at National Lipid Association meetings at length about this, um, and we don't know why that happens, but that just seemed to be the only thing in only one of the two major trials that happened. But there was no cognitive effects. People were very worried about Alzheimer's and dementia related to this because cholesterol is used as far as the processes in creating your neurons, your brain cells but that was unfounded. So there really isn't such thing as too low cholesterol because your body can continually produce it. And by the time we put people on cholesterol medications, there's enough cholesterol stored in your body to quite last the rest of your life. Have any studies been conducted on the effects of intermittent fasting and the process of autophagy and lowering LDL? I love, these questions are terrific, thank you. Um, not yet but we want to do them. I am so interested in intermittent fasting, especially in the autophagy part, because I think we, we've already seen with intermittent fasting, decreased glucose, decreased diabetes, and decreased inflammation. And since a majority of the reason why we develop plaques is the inflammation component, I really do think even if the LDL doesn't improve with intermittent fasting, which I think it would, I think uh, you'd at least decrease your heart disease risk because you're going to decrease your glucose, and that's going to be important, and you're decreasing inflammation, which is also incredibly important and decreasing the risk of heart disease. So I'm all for intermittent fasting. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner myself, um, and I found it great not only for weight loss, but I do think it's going to help reduce uh, heart disease, even though we don't know for sure in clinical trials. It's hard to do dietary clinical trials because you have to like watch people really carefully and really trust that they're doing what you tell them to do. <laughs> My cardiologists have prescribed phenovibrate, 45 milligrams, to treat high triglycerides, would I need to be on this medication for life? Um, typically. Now, it depends on what the triglycerides are from. What I always tell the people that I train, um, triglycerides are typically, if it's just triglycerides and the rest of the cholesterol panel looks okay, it's usually because of something else. It um, could be from kidney disease. It could be from diabetes. Um, it could be medications uh, that can lead to high triglycerides. Um, so I always tell people, yes, treat the high triglycerides if they're very high, but find what the source is. Is it poorly controlled diabetes? If you control the diabetes, that triglyceride level will come down. Is it too much sugar or alcohol in the diet? Control that, that triglyceride will come down. Um, on top of that, if the cholesterol is high as well, uh, statins actually work better than fibrates in not only decreasing triglycerides, but also decreasing LDL. There was another part to, the, to this uh, person's uh, question. He said, I try to eat a well-balanced diet, but not very active on exercise. What are some conservative and natural methods or advice to reduce triglycerides and improve HDL, cholesterol, and lower LDL? That's a good question. And, and unfortunately, exercise is still going to be the mainstay. Um, you, again, Taking fish oil has been helpful. There's actually a newer fish oil on the market called the SEPA, which is prescription only and can sometimes be expensive, unfortunately, even though it's really just a purified fish oil. Um, and even if that, that doesn't decrease triglyceride, the SEPA has been shown to reduce cardiac mortality. And that's, that's natural, but it's still by prescription. So it's kind of a little bit of both. Um, if there's limitations in exercise, there's other ways to do it that maybe non-weight bearing exercises. Um, I know a lot of my patients that can't weight bear for any reason can do pool exercises. 
um, or even just do chair exercises and that can help to, to increase your HDL and reduce your triglycerides as well. Are these new drugs covered in most insurance programs? Uh, yes, they are, but getting them covered is where it gets tricky. And that's another, another thing I, I, I liked. I, well, this is recorded, so I'm not gonna say too much, but uh, I've gotten very good at knowing what insurance companies are looking for and, and basically answering their questions quite well in order to get these medications covered. Because when covered, they're, they're a lot less expensive. Um, and honestly, when Inclisiran comes out, the PCS kind inhibitors, their price is gonna drop significantly. Because I know a lot of people are gonna to move toward prescribing Inclisiran because it's gonna be one injection every six months. So even if, if it is expensive, even if it's expensive covered by insurance, it's still one sum every six months, which in the end may still make it more affordable than the PCS kind inhibitors is what we're predicting. And on that note with that, um, the, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it right. Inclisiran. Uh, what about pregnancy and the newest drug on the horizon? Hmm. Very good question. So as far as the newest drug that has been tested in pregnant women, um, PCS inhibitors, there's currently a trial ongoing. Um, for ethical reasons, I, I'm not part of that trial, um, and I don't think I'm going to be. Um, so we don't know yet if PCS inhibitors are, are safe yet um, in pregnant women, and we're definitely not going to test in cholesterol in pregnant women until we know that it's safe in PCS inhibitors first. Um, so that might be years and years and years down the line. But the good news is when it comes to having high cholesterol while pregnant, it's not going to be a big deal because you don't, having high cholesterol for, for nine to 14 months um, is, is not going to really cause a lot of damage. It's having high cholesterol for 10 years, 20 years. That's what it takes for these plaques to build up and cause issues. FDA and NEJM mentioned that eggs in moderation are not bad, including yolk. Your thoughts on this? So, so nothing, I, I can name maybe like processed meats um, and really, really high sugary stuff we can say is bad. If you can get rid of bacon altogether, you're a big winner right there. Um, but anything in moderation is okay. I mean, I say, when I say, I didn't say, you know, these foods are contraindicated to life, except for the trans fatty acids. Um, but, you know, anything in moderation is still okay. I will still have an egg and with a yolk. Um, but let's say you have, you know, an egg, two eggs every other morning in an omelet. And that's like, that's your, your thing. If you took one of those omelets or two of those omelets and used egg whites, or maybe use one full egg and one egg white, every little bit will count and help to decrease your cholesterol. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not asking for everyone to become vegan for any, for any, uh, for any purpose. I'm just asking for people to, you know, make small stepwise changes. Does long-term statin use cause the liver to stop producing cholesterol permanently? It does not. So once, once, statins are, once statins are taken away, in about a week and a half or so, your, your liver will go right back to what it was doing before. And there's still other pathways outside of that pathway that your liver still will make cholesterol with, even with the statins on board. Do, do statins have any effect on short-term memory? No, they don't. Why does the newest injectable need to be given in office? Um, the reason why is because we, we're still basically, with the amount that has to be given, we wanna make sure that nothing gets wasted or falls outside the skin. So typically we want nurses to inject it um, in the every six month dosing. There may come a time, and PCS kind inhibitors when they first came out were injected in offices every two weeks, every four weeks. Um, with most of these new drugs, we like to make sure that everything is controlled in a controlled setting like in the office. Um, before we start having people do it at home. Does menopause cause an increase in cholesterol? It definitely can. Uh, both menopause and even pregnancy can cause an increase in LDL. Now, that increase is not a significant one where I think that you know, the, your age more than your hormone composition is gonna determine your risk of heart disease. However, if you notice a significant increase by 30 milligrams per deciliter or more, above your baseline LDL, that could be a reason just to get checked out, maybe monitor your cholesterol a bit better. Does OTC fish oil help reduce heart disease risk? Gosh, I wish it did. We've tried so hard in clinical trials to make it happen, and I will still use it. 
um, because it does help to reduce triglycerides. But when you compare it, when you compare it to placebo, it did not decrease the risk of heart disease or decrease mortality in patients. So unfortunately, if I had to choose, you know, one thing to, to get rid of if it's bothering you, fish oil doesn't make a difference with heart disease or mortality, although it can lower the triglycerides. It was reported that statin can increase blood sugar. How to manage high LDL in type 2 diabetes patients? Could statin that's, be used? That's a great question. So statins alone don't increase blood glucose. It was a report that was put out there, um, but what was founded, what we actually found out as we reviewed this, was that those patients already had a higher glucose and that the patients in the placebo group also had high glucose and they were equally uh, they equally had the chance of developing diabetes and having higher glucose. What is a VAP test and who or when should you get one? A VAP test? I don't think I know what a VAP test is. I'm confused. Is there, um, I see, okay, exactly. I see what is a VAP test and who or when should you get one? Um, gosh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's see. It was reported that stat, oh, I already answered this one. Okay, that one's been, okay. Um, it sounds like very high LDL greater than 250, especially with a good diet, is almost always genetic. Is this correct? Most likely. So I, I will genetically test patients if they have an LDL above 200 typically. It's, excuse me. It's really hard to eat enough cholesterol to make it that high. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, so I typically will, will do genetic testing in the office if I have someone with a high enough cholesterol. Are triglycerides high only from eating too much sugar? Mine were high, but I take phenovibrate and they are at a normal level now. I am not diabetic. Okay. Um, it, so triglycerides can be from, again, it can be a breakdown product of sugar because again, when sugar is in your bloodstream, it's very inflammatory. Like think of sugar crystals being sharp. It's not actually like that in the bloodstream, but this is just the analogy I'm using. Um, it can be sharp. It can make you, it can cause inflammation. So our body does, it stores it as something more mushy like triglycerides. So again, borderline high glucose, even not diabetic levels of high glucose can be stored as triglycerides. And some people, of course, their triglycerides can be a byproduct of the amount of, of cholesterol they take in. Um, phenofibrate is a great way to decrease triglycerides. Now, phenofibrate like uh, fish oil, although it decreases triglycerides, does not have an impact on cardiovascular mortality or cardiovascular disease in the future. I've been taking Ruvastatin for years and have never understood all of these details. Do oh, you wait, hold on get... one sec. I got the, I have the VAP. Oh, okay. Oh, a vertical, the vertical profile. I'm sorry, the A threw me off. Um, a vertical profile is not a, it, it's, it's a little much. I'll be honest. It's basically a, a it's all, all the cholesterol we talked about before. It, it, it measures the VLDL, it measures the, the B proteins, the A proteins. Um, it's very, it, it's kind of complex and it has a lot of different meanings. However, we haven't found that measuring any of these little particles makes a huge difference in, in treating heart disease. Now, with that regard, I will sometimes check two things, B100, protein, para, uh, protein B100, because that's on all of the molecules, uh, all the lipoproteins that cause atherosclerosis have B100. I'll check that sometimes separately. Um, I also check lipoprotein A. Even patients that have mildly high cholesterol and, and lower risk, if their LP little a is elevated, those people are at increased risk of developing heart disease. Thank you for, for that. I apologize for not recognizing VAP. I, 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 I used to say VP, I'm sorry. I've been, I'll go back to the question. I've been sorry about that. I just, I saw that in the, the questions. <laughs> Rubastatin for years and have never understood all the details. Do you suggest taking Rubastatin less frequently if my numbers are low. No, if, you're, if your numbers are low, I would just keep it going as long as you're tolerating it okay. The lower you go, I mean, basically, once you go below 70, every 10 or 20 milligrams per deciliter under 70, your body then starts to take cholesterol 
from those plaques. We've done studies where we've actually seen reduction in plaque content as the LDL goes below 70. So go low if you can. Have you heard of taking VIT D3 to prevent leg cramps when taking statins? I have heard of it and some of my patients will swear by it. I don't have proof of it yet, but again, I, if vitamin D is not dangerous for you in regular dosing, you don't want to overdo it, obviously. Um, and patients that have low vitamin D are more likely to have cramps at baseline. So if you introduce a drug that potentially can cause cramps, you're more likely to get cramps. So if you have a low vitamin D, I definitely treat that. And on top of that, a low vitamin D can lead to high cholesterol and high triglycerides. So treating vitamin D can be very, very important. Is increasing oatmeal consumption effective in lowering LDL cholesterol? Absolutely. It's one of the, it's one of the many different lifestyle changes we can make to help with our cholesterol. It depends on what kind of oatmeal though. Let's be careful here. I'm talking kind of plain, simple, maybe add a couple pieces of fruit to it oatmeal. Um, if you're buying, I'm not, I can't name brand names, um, but if you're buying like the, the, the processed ones, the sugary ones, like the peaches and cream, um, yes, the high fiber is helpful. And that's the best part of oatmeal. Oatmeal is just so chock full of fiber that's going to help reduce your cholesterol. But if you're making it with milk and you have the peaches and cream with lots of sugar, yeah, the fiber is going to be helpful, but then you're also adding the other stuff to it too. So I usually use, I'll use steel cut oatmeal that I'll make in a, in a, in a pot uh, or just the quick oats. And I'll probably use it with a little almond milk because that's yummy. Um, and that can be great. Even almond milk with a little bit of loaf of no fat yogurt with some fruit and a little bit of peanut butter. You can put that in the fridge overnight for an overnight oats. That's absolutely wonderful. My son is 12 years old and weighs 150 pounds. What should ideal cholesterol be? Um, so ideal cholesterol doesn't change a whole lot with age. Now, I, I, I'm not a pediatrician, so I can't really speak on that uh, 100%. But um, ideally, you'd want his cholesterol below 130. And that's the LDL cholesterol. My total cholesterol is high, but I have low blood pressure and my HA1C is 5.3. My husband has low cholesterol and high blood pressure and his HA1C is 5.6. Why do I have high cholesterol and my husband with high blood pressure does not have high cholesterol? That's, that's a good question. Um, so cholesterol is not necessarily related to blood pressure. Um, Blood pressure, and high cholesterol, and diabetes, all three of those together are risks of developing heart disease, but each one can be separate from the others. Um, high cholesterol doesn't cause high blood pressure, and high blood pressure typically doesn't cause high cholesterol. So it is possible to have high cholesterol, have normal blood pressure, and normal HbA1c, and it's also possible to have diabetes and have a normal cholesterol and normal blood pressure. I am taking Torvast. I'm sorry, I couldn't pronounce it. A tor a can I also take coenzyme Q? Yes, you can. Um, some people, again, I have patients that swear by it. They say they take coenzyme Q10, it makes them feel so much better. Um, but there's no, I, I just from a doctor's standpoint, there's no clinical evidence. There's no large trials that show that Q enzyme, coenzyme Q10 is any better than placebo at either preventing heart disease or preventing the side effects from statins. But it's not terribly expensive. And if, if you like it, it makes you feel okay. It's not dangerous either, so. Have any studies been conducted on, oh, I think I already asked this question. Effects on intermittent fasting in the process. Yes, I already did. Yep. Sorry That's about that. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding meats, is one better than others, such as lean beef, pork or chicken? Um, gosh, it, it, your, your, your lean chicken is going to be your best option there because it's going to be the lowest in saturated fat. Um, pork is then your second. And then beef, of course, is the highest in saturated fat. Um, but if, I mean, if you can avoid, um, uh, avoid red meat entirely, that's, that's great. If not, I understand. Trust me. You know, I'm, I'm a human being, I'm not a monster. <laughs> Um, you can just try to limit your portions. You know, we are used to, to big old burgers, but even if you just are eating these, this food, they're high in saturated fat, but you decrease the amount of saturated fat by just decreasing the portions, you can still make a big difference. Can krill oil or omega-3 capsules increase HDL? Um, yes, yes, they can. 
what does milk thistle do to help liver function? So, gosh, how it actually works out liver function, I'm not terribly sure of, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I do know some people have been taking milk, uh, milk thistle in order to help with fatty liver disease. Let's see. What is the role of nitric oxide in heart disease? Uh, nitric oxide is terrific. So nitric oxide is something that's naturally formed in our bodies, in our blood vessels, um, to help keep our blood vessels open and reduce inflammation in those blood vessels. But the big thing that does nitric oxide is keep the blood vessels open and keep the blood flow going smooth. Um, now, there are things we can do to increase nitric oxide. So we know exercise can naturally increase nitric oxide. Um, and there's also some medications out there that can increase that nitric oxide, like nitrates, for instance, like nitroglycerin that you take for heart disease or for chest pain. Um, or long-acting nitroglycerin, like things like isosorbide mononitrate or isosorbide dinitrate. My HDL is very high off the chart, which increases my total cholesterol to 235. Should I still be treated for high cholesterol? So that's a really good question. So this is still under a lot of debate. There was a Swedish study done about maybe six years ago and patients with HDLs above 100 were at higher risk of heart disease than patients without that. So you'd be the type of patient that we probably try to run genetic tests on and maybe would actually benefit from either a, possibly a small dose statin. Can you please discuss the connection between statins, muscle cramps, and calcium? You mentioned it before, oh, just a little slower, please. <laughs> Sure, yes, here, if you don't, uh, I'm gonna go back in my slides a bit. There we go. So here is you know, how statins are working here. This right here, mevalonate, is the production of this is blocked by HMG-CoA reductase, by statins, um, by blocking this. Um, now it has other pathways it can be made, but this is the main pathway it uses. And this actually is actually used in our muscles to enable calcium to escape our muscles. So patients that end up being uh, more dependent on this pathway, when they don't have enough of this mevalonate, they release, they don't release calcium as easily from muscles and that can cause muscle cramps. And that also is a theoretical uh, mechanism. We don't know 100% for sure. This is what just made the most sense in biochemical models. I just had lab work and my total cholesterol is 240, my HDL is 65, and my triglycerides is 68. My LDL cholesterol is 159. Should I see a cardiologist and begin medication? That's a really good question. So you're in that borderline area. Now it depends on age too. Uh, if you're above 40, um, you don't necessarily have to see a cardiologist. I'd love to see you. Um, but you can also see your primary care physician and ask them to calculate your risk score. In fact, you can do it on your own um, by typing in American College of Cardiology Risk Calculator Plus, plus sign, um, and then click on the first thing you see on Google, which will be that website. And then you can put all those numbers in, including your age, gender, last blood pressure, um, smoking, diabetes, all that good stuff. Um, not necessarily good stuff, you know what I mean. Um, and then use that to calculate what your risk would be. The, the calculator itself, when you click view advice, will actually give you some of the advice from the American College of Cardiology. It's trying to steal my job. Um, but anyway, um, depending on those results, you can also give us a call. You can call the Access Center, the number that I provide at the end of the talk. I can get back to that now. Um, I went too far, my goodness. Um, and that should be a way to basically get you connected with either a cardiologist or one of our preventive cardiologists like myself. What about the plaque that has already formed? Do statins help decrease that or do they just prevent additional formation? Great question. We used to think it didn't, it didn't, it just prevented more formation. And that's actually what we've been telling people for years and years and years and years. But recently, actually, as of 2019, uh, we saw that actually when your LDL goes below 70, some of the fat that's hidden in there, some of those, those foam cells we talked about get reabsorbed by having increased LDL receptors, and also by having lower LDL in the blood, it kind of forces some of that out. So we've actually seen using ultrasound in arteries, reduction in plaque size when your LDL cholesterol goes below 70. Here's another question that 
um, pertains to like plaque buildup. Can we do anything to remove the amount of plaque buildup that might already be in our arteries? Can plaque go away? That's a great question. So the, the plaque is, is a calcified cap, which is where the inflammation kind of built up at first. And the calcified cap actually protects it from rupturing and prevents it from heart attacks from happening. The gushy, mushy stuff inside that makes it grow bigger, that can actually decrease in time if your LDL is below 70. Okay. What is the best cholesterol medicine to take if you've had a kidney liver transplant? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I sit on the, uh, the liver transplant committee uh, with uh, Dr. Kroc, Dr. Scheidman, uh, Dr. Uh, Riley, and Dr. Stein. And um, a lot of times when I'll see patients, because a lot of medications you take after transplant can increase your triglycerides and increase your LDL, unfortunately. Um, but it beats the alternative of, of losing that liver that you just got. Um, travastatin is my go-to because it's not metabolized in the liver whatsoever. It does not have a liver pathway, so it's less likely to have effects on liver function, especially in a transplanted source. My cholesterol is 278, LDL 142, and HDL is 118. My HDL keeps going up slowly. Is genetic testing recommended? For HDL greater than 100, I, I may give it a shot. Um, you may not find anything which is good for you. Um, but o L HDL over 100, I, I tend to want to do further testing. Um, I know some people go, woohoo, the good cholesterol is really high, but when it gets above 100, I just like to do further testing to make sure nothing else might be going on. I have an elongated QT and medications further lengthens it. So I have to be very careful on the medications I take. I have taken Lipitor and Provostatin. Both have caused severe muscle cramps and muscle weakness. What type of statins would you recommend being heart disease runs in my family? Um, so the good news is statins should not interfere with your QTC. So that's, that's super good news. Um, if you had muscle cramps in the two statins you mentioned, those are lipophilic statins. I'd probably start you on something like uh, Resuvastatin or Crestor, um, at a small dose, maybe five milligrams, maybe start you at every other night and then move you to every night if necessary, depending on your lipid profile. Is the ratio between HDL and LDL important? Well, yes, yes and no. Um, the absolute number I think is gonna be more important of LDL. Um, the ratio is only important again when your HDL is less than 100. Um, and that basically tells you if you have a low ratio, you've got more HDL. And that tends to mean that you're more protected from heart disease. Now, again, if your HDL is, is super high and your LDL is super high, you still may be at risk of heart disease. But if you say, if you have like, let's say an LDL of 135, which is mildly elevated um, and an HDL of 72, well, I look at that as a, as a win because that means that your HDL, uh, your, your HDL LDL ratio is actually pretty darn good. So even though you've got mildly elevated LDL, uh, you'd probably be somebody who would not start medication and probably just continue to work with lifestyle modification to try to get that LDL below 130. Oh. 11 year old child with 95 LDL, 37 low HDL, and 225 high triglycerides, 160 pounds. Does he need, does he need to be on cholesterol or any medications? Um, I'm not 100% sure. So I typically don't work in the pediatric population. Um, and it sounds like the LDL is not terribly high. So triglycerides might be the problem. Um, so I would just make sure the sugar levels are okay. And I would just kind of do some dietary changes to get that triglycerides down. Um, and, you know, let's, let's run around. Let's, you know, be 11 year olds and, and run in the yard and, and have a good time because that'll help decrease triglycerides as well. What is the major difference between statin versus fibrate medications when it comes to lower high triglycerides? Good question. So phenofibrates work primarily at lowering triglycerides. Um, where statins work at lowering triglycerides and lowering uh, LDL. They both work in different mechanisms, but both work in the liver. What about apple cider vinegar? It has been reported that it dilates 
the blood vessels and helps lower blood pressure, among other things. Your comments. I've heard a lot about, now I, I've yet to see it in large clinical trials. Um, I've, I've heard it colloquially, I've seen it um, in social media, I've seen it on the news, but I've yet to see it in a big clinical trial yet. So I probably would wait. Um, I mean, again, there's no dangers other than indigestion um, if for, for taking apple cider vinegar. So if, if you like taking it, you don't, it doesn't bother you at all. It's not gonna hurt you as far as we know. However, before I start recommending to patients as, as, a, as a cure-all or something that will help, um, I'd like to see it in, in clinical trials or in formal studies first. I've been taking 40 milligrams of simvastatin for 16 years, even though my cholesterol was okay after I had a stent put in. Is there danger in long-term use or is a primary care doctor qualified to manage my care here? Yeah, so again, I know many primary care physicians that will, will uh, take care of patients that have had stents before and they're comfortable with that. Um, if I, let's say I see a patient in the hospital who has stent placed, I'll usually follow up with them on an annual basis and just keep up, keep up that work. There's no problem with taking 40 milligrams of simvastatin. Usually we recommend a more higher potency statin for patients with known heart disease, but it all depends on the cholesterol level. Um, I have some people who are on a small dose of simvastatin, but their LDL is below 70. And that's the goal. So if you maintain that goal, that's going to help reduce the chance of having a heart attack in the future. And that's great. I have seen statements of an addictive interaction between provostatin sodium, 20 milligrams, and metroprol. Metoprolol. Yes. Um, S-U-C-C-E-R, 25 milligram. Are you aware of any dangers with taking both medications? such as not being able to stop them without se severe effects? So pravastatin, no. Um, metoprolol succinate, it's not an addictive interaction, but they're basically, metoprolol, it's a whole different um, uh, sort of thing. Um, it's, it, it's basically, it, reduce, it, it increases the amount of beta receptors in your body because you're blocking those beta receptors to lower your blood pressure. So if you withdraw that medication all of a sudden, then now you have too many beta receptors more than usual, and you're gonna have this rebound hypertension or high blood pressure and rebound tachycardia or high heart rate. Um, that's just a, a, a format of withdrawing the medication. So typically when I take someone off of a beta blocker or like metoprolol, I do it in a stepwise fashion. My doctor told me that I have a fatty liver. What should be my concerns? Um, so that's a good question. Um, my biggest concern about having a fatty liver is the progression to cirrhosis. Um, the best way to prevent that is by preventing the, the cause of fatty liver, which happen, which is primarily related um, to higher cholesterol. Um, so if you have fatty liver, we have seen some reduction and reversal of that fatty liver disease. If your cholesterol is high and you start treatment with statins, it can help reduce that. Both of my parents had heart disease at 70 Ought I be tested to see how my arteries are doing in terms of plaque? You said, what was the age again? I'm sorry. Um, at, 70. at 70. I'm guessing so, this person's 70. Ought I be tested to see my, how my arteries are doing in terms of plaque? Um, so again, family history in general will increase your risk. But um, what we look for as far as family history that puts you at higher risk is going to be male first degree relatives and heart disease at ages less than 55 and female first degree relatives with ages uh, at, at the start of heart disease of less than 65. Um, and so if you don't have that, then you're not typically at a higher risk or not. But if you're curious about what your, your chances of developing heart disease are, the best thing to do is have regular appointments with your primary care physician, check your cholesterol annually and check your blood pressure as often as you're able to. What's the best medication for controlling LDL in diabetic patients? Uh, the best in diabetic patients, there's not really one that's better than others. Um, in diabetic patients, because I, used, I, you, I view diabetes as a, a heart disease equivalent. Basically, if you have diabetes, I kind of pretend that you have heart disease already in order to be more aggressive with your care to reduce the chance of you developing heart disease. That sounds kind of confusing, I'm sorry. Um, so I like to use Lipitor or Torvastatin or Resuvastatin or Crestor, since those are the ones that have the highest potency. What would be interaction between phenovibrate, 160 milligram, and 
and excuse me if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Is that a mod uh, 10 milligrams? 10 milligrams. Um, I am on both. Yes. Um, so, pheno, so azetamide can increase the muscle aches and cramps related to phenofibrates. So I tend not to use them together unless I have to. Not that you can't. It's not a contraindication. It's not like you can't do it at all. But if you start developing muscle cramps or aches on both those medications, it's usually because they work together to increase that side effect. My dad's triglyceride more than 1,000. LDL 240, what's best way to control it? He is 76 years old, exercise, and is not diabetic. I'd be very worried that your, your father has a, a form of familial hypercholesterolemia, a genetic form of high cholesterol, um, and also may relate to some of the beta proteins, which leads to higher triglycerides as well. Um, the best way to control it is going to be medications for him, unfortunately. I don't think there's a way to do it just with lifestyle alone. Um, also, if he ends up being positive for um, a familial disorder, I also make sure that you get it checked as well. Okay, let's see. Um, I know we're probably past uh, 750. Well, I'm, I'm answering, I'm trying to answer some in typing as well, too. So this first one here can lower the cholesterol level of reverse heart disease. Um, yes, it can in a way. Um, just to further that comment, um, it, it can reduce the amount of plaques, uh, or the, it re reduce the thickness of the plaques. It doesn't reverse heart disease altogether, but it can reduce the, the plaques in the arteries by size. I've been on 40 milligrams of atorvastin for years. Should I be concerned about that? I would not be. As long as you're tolerating it well, it's not causing any significant side effects for you. There's nothing unsafe about that. Would you address if cheese is bad for your cholesterol? I mean, bad, bad's a harsh term. Poor cheese. I mean, I love cheese, but um, it's Who not doesn't? <laughs> right. Um, it's not. I'm not saying anything is, is is good or bad. I shouldn't really. I don't like to, you know, judge foods like that. But certain cheeses are going to be higher in saturated fats. So the harder cheeses, cheddars, parmesans, you know, the delicious ones, um, can be higher in fat. But things like cottage cheese and ricotta cheese. Uh, tend to be lower in saturated fat. So again, you want to limit your, your kind of uh, high fat or, or let's say full fat dairy products. And if possible, if you say, gosh, I have to have this cheese, which I know that feeling, try to limit yourself to kind of part skim or full skim or, or no fat uh, dairy. If you have problems with allergies to medications, is it bad to try, try a medication I'm not sure if, uh, is to last many months. If you have medic, if you have problems with allergies to medication, is it bad to try medication that is to that may last many months? Um, so not necessarily. Um, just because you have allergies to some medicines, don't mean you have some allergies to others. Um, so it depends on the medicine. Um, but I probably you know would try if it, you know like a PCS kind of inhibitor only lasts a couple of weeks. I try that first before I try something like Enclisteran that could last six months. Now, again, there's been no allergic reactions to, to Enclisteran as all because it's not a typical medication. It's, it's messenger RNA, which our bodies can't be allergic to. I have taken statins, Zidia, and Welco and have not been able to take any of them. Would you say to wait for the, the new medication well, not necessarily. I mean, you still, um, this is for Carol Shirk. Carol, um, you still may be a candidate for PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, and so it's something to do talk to your doctor about and potentially if, if it can be approved by your insurance, you can, you can be put on that. If you'd like to wait for the new one, you can do that. But my guess is some people may not be approved for that medicine until they've tried the medicines before them like the PCSK9 inhibitors. I have significantly changed my lifestyle in terms of diet and exercise, and my cholesterol levels have reduced a bit, but not as much as I'd hope. Can I ever expect to get off statins? Oh my gosh, um, me too. <laughs> I have I have done I have done a world of the evidence I've shown you, and again, a lot of lifestyle changes I've personally made have not impacted my um, my cholesterol as much as I wanted to because. Again, a lot of it is because of the production of cholesterol in the liver that is hereditary. We can't prevent that. Um, so at this time, I don't think 
I think you'll, I would continue on a statin because they're safe, effective, and can basically increase your lifespan. Um, so I would keep on taking them and instead of, of being mad that you're on medication, be happy you're on one of the few medications that can make your life longer. Can tamoxifen lower HDL? Potentially. Um, I've seen tamoxifen lower HDL. I've seen tamoxifen increase LDL because tamoxifen is an estrogen-like um, uh, substance or uh, drug. Um, but the benefits well outweigh the risks because patients on tamoxifen have a much decreased risk of developing a repeat breast cancer. So that's a ton better for you than having a slight increase in your LDL and a slight reduction in your HDL. Is Roosevelt, oh, I'm sorry, where'd that question go? Um, can Repatha cause weight gain? Uh, no, not that I've seen. Okay. Now, sometime, to be honest with you, I've had two people gain weight on Repatha and part of that was because their cholesterol was so good, they got really excited and went to town on saturated fats. <laughs> Are the weight gain effects of statins like warfarin overrated or population dependent? Um, so warfarin is an anticoagulant, not a statin. Um, but the weight gain effects of statins have, have not been seen. They were the same in the statin group plus the placebo group. My LDL is 155 and my PCP didn't seem concerned. Is that high? So anything ab above 130 is considered elevated cholesterol, but it also depends on your risk. I mean, I've had a 27 year old with an LDL of 155. At 27, it's not a terrible risk. It's just a chance to do lifestyle modification. Um, what I would do is maybe put, the, your, put your numbers in that American College of Cardiology risk calculator, determine your risk. And if your risk is above 7.5%, that would be that would lead to a discussion with your primary care physician and say, hey, listen, I, I did my risk score and I'm at an elevated risk. I need you to do something or at least refer me to the Penn State Lipid Clinic. Is Rosuva statin the best choice to be on if you're borderline diabetic? I, I, I have a personal love relationship with Rosuva statin, has the least amount of side effects and tends to work pretty well. So I tend to choose Rosuva statin in all my patients. Um, uh, as, 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 my, as my therapy of, of choice for the most part. Um, but it's not any better or worse than the other statins with borderline diabetes. They all will be effective at decreasing cholesterol and decreasing your risk of developing heart disease in the setting of borderline diabetes. Is azitamide the same thing as Zocor? Was on something like that many years ago, but cholesterol has never increased above 218 since going off of it and doctor expresses no concern. Um, so azetamibe and Zocor are different. So Zocor is a simvastatin, so that's a statin, and azetamibe is a completely different mechanism. It blocks cholesterol uptake in the gut. Um, so, um, but, but if your LDL cholesterol is 218, I am very concerned. Um, if your total cholesterol is above 218, it depends on what the breakdown is. It depends on what the LDL and the HDL are. Okay, we have two questions left in the queue. Um, right, does I can I can do these real quick then? I've got I love eggs. <laughs> I love the, the kids are at the door. I'm so sorry, everybody. They're they're kind of I hear some knocks and it's going to be bedtime pretty soon. I apologize, but I love eggs. Me too. So how many a week is safe? Well, there's not really a direct number. And it's different for everyone. I know some people they can eat two eggs every morning, no problem, um, and their cholesterol is still good. You know, there's a genetic component to this that we need to work with. So it depends on what your cholesterol is now. If you enjoy an egg in the morning, I mean, okay, that's fine. Maybe if you love eggs, use eggs and then decrease the amount of red meat or other saturated fats in your diet. You know, skip dessert, but have an egg in the morning. It's all about this balance. So I don't want to tell people not to eat anything, um, but try and do some moderation. Or maybe if you enjoy, you know, an egg every day, do one full egg. The next day, do an egg yolk, full egg, egg yolk, vice versa. And last question, does phenovibrate contri contribute to weight gain? It does not. Uh, krill oil versus fish oil, about the same thing. Um, I, I, I don't think um, uh, fish oil or krill oil, one is not really better than the other. And then total cholesterol is 218, HDL cholesterol is 65, ooh, that's good. Um, any concern over the 218, the total cholesterol, not really. So again, if that's the case, you know, it all depends on what your LDL cholesterol is. With a cholesterol of 65, that's with an HDL cholesterol of 65, that's pretty darn good. 
but again, the absolute numbers become less important than the absolute risk. So I would definitely advocate for you guys to go to that website, um, the American College of Cardiology Risk Calculator, um, and type your numbers in and get an idea of what your risk score is. All right, we, we maintained 70 people for all those questions. So thanks everyone for sticking through all that. <laughs> and we answered 80 questions. All right. You're welcome, Marie. <laughs> all all right. Right. I guess I will have to uh, uh, get the kids to bed. Um, thank you all so much for having me. This is terrific. And, and like I said before, if there's any uh, further questions, any more comments, any issues, um, call that number on your screen. Uh, try to make an appointment with one of us and we're, we're more than happy to help you out. If any of this stuff kind of rang home with you, ask your primary care physicians too. And if they can't answer the question for you, or if they have more questions as well, then, then have, them, have them refer you to our clinics. I mean, I think, you know, having something like this, or maybe a lot of people coming to clinics, so it may be a couple months, but that's okay. We'll still end up ma making sure your questions get answered when we see you, okay? All right. Thank you, Dr. Ferbaniak. Super fun. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.